Hi, and welcome to Chapter 7, Analyzing Common Stocks. This is Part 1. First, we're going to talk about securities analysis. So when you hear the term securities analysis, what we're talking about here is coming up with some sort of formulation to, to develop a successful investing program. So we're looking um, <clears throat> to understand what are the basic principles of securities analysis. In this chapter, we'll introduce the idea of efficient markets so, which begs the question, who needs security analysis if the market is efficient and prices are efficiently calculated? So now, let's just talk about some basics here. So, security, anal security analysis, what is this? It's basically a process of investigation to collect the information you need, organize it in um, a way that makes sense that you could use the information to help you determine the value of the stock, which we call an intrinsic value. So an intrinsic value is what we feel the true value of the stock is worth. And this could be different from what the actual trading value of the stock is. So the idea is we want to come up with a value that says this stock should be worth $10 per share. And if it's currently trading at $5 per share, that would be a buy. So you're only, you only want to buy a stock if the market price is not greater than the intrinsic value or what you as an investor have estimated or think the stock is worth. So how do you develop an intrinsic value? Well, that's a difficult part. It's based on the future cash flows, the current discount rate, and risks associated with its future performance. So there's a lot of factors that are going to go into your calculation of the intrinsic value of a stock. There's no perfect way of doing it. There's no one set formula that will achieve this. It's part art, part science. Uh, it has to do with, with some mathematics and some experience. So it's everyone's like their own cook and everybody serves up their intrinsic value um, slightly different. Now, let's talk about some basic principles and approaches to securities analysis. So we do have this three-step process uh, which we'll go into detail more later, but basically it's called a top-down approach. So we start out the biggest level possible, which is economic analysis. And we look to see where the economy is and its potential effects on business and where it's going to be going in the near future. Then we move on to the next level, which is down from the economy to the industry analysis. So we want to find specific industries who are going to take advantage of the current economic activity. And we want to know as much as, as much as much as we can about those industries. And then we can bring it down to the last level, which is the fundamental analysis. And this is when we're looking at the financials and the operating conditions for one company. And we're analyzing the company for its expectations of its future performance, its stock price performance, its business performance, its financial performance. And so if we if we do this fundamental analysis, this fundamental analysis with say 20 companies in the industry. We do one fundamental analysis for you know, each of these 20 companies. Hopefully, our analysis will be able to rank these companies from best to worst for in order of, of investment potential. Now, let's get back to the idea of an efficient market. So keep in mind that there are millions of investors buying and selling stocks every day. So the security analysis is something some investors do to help them figure out what is the basic value of a stock so know, to know whether to buy or sell it. So trying to identify stocks whose intrinsic value is going to be different than the current stock price. Theoretically, with so many people buying and selling the stock and so much liquidity and supply and demand occurring, the market hypothetically should be um, efficient, meaning that the stock price is your C in the, in the, when you get a quote on a stock should be the actual value of the, what the company's worth, uh, determined by millions of investors buying and selling shares of the stock every day. Now, smaller stocks, of course, will have less activity, less investors involved, but the premise is that, you know, some securities can be mispriced in the marketplace some of the time. So even though the efficient market hypothesis is saying that securities are rarely, if ever, mispriced, and security analysis is not capable of finding mispriced securities, um, 
too often. Now, here's the difference is that if you observe the markets, you see there are extreme cases of market bubbles and market contractions that do uh, and on occasion put stocks create an environment where stocks are, are overly valued and when stocks are greatly undervalued. So the fundamental analysis can help when, when the market gets into it, those extreme conditions. But there are a good number of years when the market is very efficient and the price of the stock is really very close to the intrinsic value of the company. Now, so the fundamental, fundamental analysis is still valuable because um, this is what is a double check to keep the market efficient. If you do your fundamental analysis and you crunch all the numbers in the financials and you find, okay, this stock is way overpriced, you sell it or you sell it short. That brings the price down. So financial markets, they're not perfect. They're not perfectly efficient, but the only way to find these pricing errors is through fundamental analysis. So you can't have a, an efficient market without having um, a number of people, a large number of people conducting this basic securities analysis, fundamental analysis to really get a better idea of what the stock price should be. Now let's move over to the economic analysis. So the economic analysis, this is going to be, we're going to be studying the, eco, you know, the economy of the world and the economy of certain nations. So if your stock is mostly a domestic stock, you might want to look more towards the domestic economy. But if your stock is an international company, you might look want to look more towards the international economy. So we're going to study the economy and then try to link back its impact on behavior of share prices. So things that we want to look at is, of course, the business cycle, key economic factors and output and developing using this to develop an outlook of where the economy is going to be going. Here's a nice slide that looks at the recessions and the stock market during recession. So the gray bars are going to be when the market is falling or in most cases because the gray bars are going to indicate the recession. So if we see the recessions going back to 1970, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And most recently we have another recession, but this is off the, um, the scale of this chart. So if we look at back in history, we see stock prices start going down, then we enter a recession, stock prices start going up before the recession is over. So for particularly long recessions um, here in, we'll say 75 and 82, and you can see how the stock market has fallen, but it always picks up before the end of the recession. Um, this is a very tiny recession here. We don't we see a little bit of fluctuation. Um, here's the 91 recession with stock market going down and back up. And then the 2000. So we see this is a little bit odd because the 2000 was actually a stock market crash along with uh, after the year 2000, we had a stock market crash and a recession that brought stocks down for a number of years. So this is an oddity here, this recession of um, 2001 that started beginning a stock market burst in 2000. So the bursting of the stock market in 2000 is what most people feel created this recession and it kept going until about 2003. So it's a partic particularly long and nasty stock market decline. Now here is the great uh, recession of 2008 and you can see it's it's the worst recession since 1982. And stocks took a huge dive here, um, going down in some cases 50% or more. But they did start to recover by the end of the recession and kept moving up, continuing through you know, uh, 2019, we had a blip in 2019, and then continuing through 2020, 2021. So we, and, and therefore, and what's, what's interesting is we did have a recession in here, but this is, the uh, cause to, you know, a rare medical event that um, occurs every 100 years or so. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, economic analysis and the business cycle. So what this is, a, this is a witness of the business cycle. The business cycle is going up and going down, and, but it goes up for longer periods and it goes down because the white is the increasing economy and the gray bars are the decreasing economy. 
<clears throat> so there's definitely a cycle there. So this, the, the change in the economy's the performance is going to affect the profitability of companies, and that's going to affect stock price. So the economy has gone through an alternating contractions and expansions of uh, business activity. Now, this is something that is just a fact of life, that business has its ups and downs. We measure this most um, often with gross domestic product, which is going to be the market value of all goods and services that a country um, has over a particular period. Usually a quarter uh, is how we most frequently measure it. It can also be looked at on an annual basis. Now, industrial production is going to be an indicator of output produced by industrial companies. So um, normally the gross domestic product is going to be index of industrial production as it moves up and down in the business cycle. And the industrial production is, is key because that's what's going to provide the output for the goods that are going to be sold, they're going to be counted towards the gross domestic product. Now, let's talk about some other key factors here that we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, later on. But we have the uh, state of the economy is, of course, going to be affected by one, government fiscal policy, two, monetary policy, and three other factors. So the government policy, taxes, government spending, uh, debt management. So when the government spends a great deal, so the last two recessions, the government's had stimulus bills to um, help uh, the country recover from the recession. So government expanding government spending as far as stimulus bills is good for the economy. Cutting taxes, recently the corporate tax rates have been changing and as they go down, that's beneficial for the economy. And if corporate tax rates go up, that's a negative for the economy. So same thing with personal taxes. If personal tax rates go up, if people are taxed more heavily, that takes money out of the economy. Now, monetary policy is something the Federal Reserve um, of different countries set. And the monetary policy is going to affect the money supply and interest rates because they can um, oftentimes create money and oftentimes um have mechanisms to affect interest rates. So of course, increasing money supply is good for the economy. Um, lowering interest rates is uh, stimulus for the economy. Now other factors such as inflation, which is overall prices increasing, consumer spending, which is involved in, you know, ordinary people like us buying things, business investments, corporations buying machinery and equipment, opening factories, and of course, foreign trade and foreign exchange rates all affect business. So let's look at these a little bit more closely. So we'll go back and we're going to start with um, gross domestic product. So this is really telling us the overall size of, of an economy. And the gross domestic product is going to be the total of, a, say for the U.S., the total dollar value of all goods and services produced in the United States. So everything that all the products the, comp the country makes and we can look at it in a year over year or quarter over quarter basis to see if there's growth in these, these numbers. And that's really the, the biggest number of the economy is gross domestic product. Now, industrial production is a little bit, um, still a pretty big number. And this is really, what is the output for factories, mines, utilities? And this is going to give us the direction of the economy because before products can really be finished, they, they're going to start out in, um, in factories, in the, the raw materials and mines and utilities. So if industrial production picks up quickly, we could expect gross domestic product to pick up later on. And this leads us to the leading economic index. So if we, we want to know, what we want to know most of all is where the, we know where the economy is in the past. We want to know where it's going to be in the future. So it's very, art, very easy to calculate where the economy has been in the past because we have the data to support that. Moving forward, trying to figure out where the economy is going to be in three months in next year or two years from now is a lot more, is a lot more difficult. However, we do have these leading economic index. So this is going to be, um, taking a number of statistics together that are leading statistics that have an effect in changing the gross domestic product. So this index will give us more of like a, an averaged, 
um, weighted, smoothed out um, indicator of where gross domestic product is going to move. So it's not looking at any one thing. It's looking at hours worked um, by manufacturing employees, uh, unemployment claims, stock prices, consumer expectations. So it's sort of a, a mix of a bunch of indicators that is the most useful, what, what they feel is a good mix for predicting where the economy is going. Um, now, personal income is something that makes it makes sense if you if you just common sense this item. People have more income, they they tend to spend more, or they might save and invest more, which gives the availability for governments and businesses to borrow more money. But by and large, when people receive more income, they're going to spend it. So if wages and salaries, dividends, rents, other types of ways people make income increase. Um, this is going to be beneficial for the economy. It's one of the reasons that when, when the economy is bad, it's wise for governments to give un the unemployed unemployment money insurance to help them maintain their purchases. So the economy sort of has a cushion uh, by helping maintain that personal income. But if personal incomes are rising, then we can expect the gross domestic product to increase as they spend more. One way to measure, you know, how that personal income is being spent is retail sales. So we want to look at are the retailers, this is businesses, shops, restaurants, are they selling more? Are, they, are their sales up? So if sales are up, that's another strong indicator that the consumer is confident, they're buying more, sales are going up, the economy is doing better. Now money, money supply is kind of complicated because this is going to be involved by most federal reserves around the world. Um, depending on the country you live, you have different dynamics of how the money supply can be affected by the government. But there are different measures of money supply, and we denote them as sort of M1, M2, which measures you know liquid forms of money, basic currency, demand deposits, uh, savings accounts. Uh, so we want to we want to pull. We want to get an idea of how much money is out there. And the way money is created is kind of hard, hard to fully describe. But, you know, of course, banks and Federal Reserves, uh, governments are the ones that create money. And it works differently from different countries. But basically, they help to expand the money supply. And sometimes this printing of money, um, if you print it too fast, you increase the money supply too fast, that could lead to inflation. So when you have very um, big government spending, big stimulus bills, this could lead to um, inflation. And this would, and if inflation kicks up, then money supply needs to be pulled back a bit um, to reduce economic activity. Now, consumer prices is how we measure inflation. So the consumer price index is going to show us changes in prices in a, in a fixed basket of goods. So we're gonna take a basket, we're gonna put a number of different uh, sellable items in that basket, and we're gonna watch uh, the prices change as the economy grows through time. And if prices increase too greatly, that's a sign of inflation. And that's how uh, inflation is going to be measured is a percentile increase in prices quarter over quarter, year over year. Now we can also look at um, producer prices. So the PPI or the purchase price index is going to show how prices change for goods over various stages of production. So basically we have our raw materials. We put this together in what would be a semi-finished good and finally a finished good. So we want to look at how, how does the these prices change from this um, stages of production, from the raw materials to the final finished product. Uh, you know, so we want to see is the material, if the producer price is going up the raw material side, which would be more commodities, or is it going in the finished goods side, which would be more labor. So this is watched pretty closely to get an idea of how prices are changing and how they're fluctuating in the economy. Uh, and this is a good idea of where the inflationary pressures are coming from. Are the inflationary pressures coming from raw materials like uh, oil, coal, 
uh, energy? Are they coming from labor, increased minimum wages, increased overtime? Following labor, employment's a very big number as well. So is the workforce expanding? Are more people employed and working? The more people that are working, the more confident the overall population becomes. The more money they spend, the greater the economy grows. So we always want to measure the number of people who are working. And we want to look at a percentage of the population that's employed. Uh, because this is the, now, if unemployment starts to decrease and we form higher amounts of unemployment, this is going to be, you know, a, a bad signal for the economy or the economy is shrinking. Uh, something else we look at is housing starts. So if if the housing market is picking up and they're starting construction on new houses, this is a very good leading indicator for improved economic activity. Because when you build a house, you use a lot of materials uh, to build a house, you know, wood, cement, then fixtures, faucets, light switches, electrical, wires, whole host of items go into making a house. And then when someone buys the house and moves in, banks are making money from the mortgage and lawyers are making money from settling the contracts. And other merchants now are going to make money as you furnish the house, you buy dishwares and you buy laundry machines and appliances. And this is all good for the economy. So if, if the economy contains 100,000 new homes that quarter, up from 50,000 the previous quarter, that's you know, going to show a pickup in the economy. So we want to track and be knowledgeable all, of all this stuff because a growing economy typically results in stocks growing their earnings and earnings per share, which results in share prices increasing. So that's why the economic analysis is so important to review. Now you can get um, sources of a summary of economic outlook. So there are plenty of economists that work for magazines and publications like Wall Street Journal, Fortune, uh, Business Week, that will try to outline and predict like a weather forecast and economic forecast or outlook. Um, now also major brokerage houses would produce their own economic reports. So this economic outlook information is going to basically give us some insight on what industries will likely expand, which will be hurt. So if you have um, a movement of many people moving away from the, the office, working from home, then you're going to have companies um, who, who are going to benefit from a work from home equipment, um, work from home monitors, work from home computers, um, telecommunication software. So any, every, any economic situation that occurs is going to be winners and losers. There's not always all losers and all winners. So even the downturn, economic downturn or an economic upheaval, some companies will come ahead and win and move forward and a lot of companies will fall behind. So this economic outlook will help focus on what companies to buy and what companies to avoid. So we want to evaluate specific industries that are likely going to do very well based on the current economic conditions. Because you don't want to just say economy is expanding, economy is contracting. You want to say what area of the economy is expanding, what area or industry of the economy is contracting. So we can, we can have a better uh, prediction of corporate profits for those industries or those companies to better place our investments. Now, developing an economic outlook is very difficult. But it's if you're good at it, it can give you one of the best insights to where sugar prices are going to go. So using uh, indicators to help project an uh, economic outlook is what we want to use to help better predict the future of the stock market. So if you look at this table 7.2, uh, this gives us just a little bit more insight on some of these economic variables and what it means for the stock market. So if we see growth in GDP, that's going to be good for the stock market. If we see um, increases in industrial production, that's going to be good for the stock market. Now, with inflation, we never want inflation or a high amount, a small amount of inflation, zero to three percent, usually isn't too harmful. But what we don't want is high inflation because that usually is very bad for stocks. So high inflation is going to lead to higher interest rates, 
which means it makes it more expensive for companies to borrow. It makes it more, more expensive for consumers to buy cars, buy houses. Uh, and this is going to typically lead to lower earnings per share multiples uh, and make stocks very uh, less attractive. So one way it can make stocks less attractive is that if the inflation shows up, the um, interest rates go up and you might look at it and say, hey, maybe I should get this safe corporate bond returning 10 percent looks a lot better than the stock market, which is actually down 15 percent, 20 percent. So it sort of increases the uh, money flow out of stocks and into safer um, things like uh, bank accounts and bonds, which are paying higher interest rates as the interest rates go up in response to the increased inflation. Now, corporate profits, of course, if corporate profits are going up, that's good for the stock market. Unemployment, an increase in unemployment is bad for the stock market. So we never want to see unemployment increasing. It's a, it's a, it's a negative economic impact or a negative for stock prices, which is just common sense. If we look at the federal budget of different countries that the stocks are, are within, so if budget surpluses occur during strong economic times, this is very good for the stock market and stocks because uh, we want to see stocks like it when governments are more fiscally responsible. Um, but when governments start bringing on larger deficits, this can lead to a downturn that... Um, is going to be bad for stocks. So if you see a country like Greece that put on a huge amount of debt and had to go to austerity, that is going to be bad for, you know, stocks that do a lot of business in that country because this is going to be a contracting approach. Let's talk about a, a, a weak currency and we'll focus on the dollar here specifically. So, uh, but you could think about whatever currency you have in your home market. So if the dollar weakens, uh, this could increase the value of U.S. firms overseas because they can be earning money at higher rates overseas and bringing them back for a bigger impact. So, for example, if the dollar is weak in relationship to the euro and a company sells a lot of products and earns euros, when they convert that back to dollars, since the dollar is weak, the euros will buy more dollars and they get a sort of like a surprise profit. So weak, a weak domestic currency will be beneficial to exporters or people who sell overseas. Now, if all your business is self-contained within your, your one currency, so if you're like a local um, store and you're selling just in your local currency, the, the change in currency may not affect you too much unless you're buying your products from overseas. Uh, interest rates, of course, we like interest rates um, to be consistent and low. If interest rates start to increase, that's bad for stock markets. And it's related to what I talked about with inflation. It sort of um, makes everything expensive and slows down the economy. And of course, money supply, we want growth in money supply as on track with the growth of the economy, but too much rapid growth can be inflationary and that's bad for the stock market. So that's why these things are so closely looked at. And you can see that when economic variables are released, the stock market reacts pretty quickly and prices change pretty quickly. Okay, so let's talk about developing an economic outlook. So the stock market typically is a leading indicator. So stock prices are looking six months or a year down the road. So if you want to know how the economy is going to be doing, look to see how the stock market did over the past three months. So if the stock market increased 20% in the past three months, that's going to say we're going to have a good economy moving forward. Um, so the stock market itself is, is a great leading indicator because people look at all the other economic indicators that I just talked about and buy and sell stock based on where they think the economy is going. So it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so that's why you see stock prices go down before a recession. The stock prices actually predict the recession, and then we see stock prices increase before the recession is over, predicting the recovery. So watching the economy, watching stock prices will, and over time, the experience of doing this and living through economic booms and busts and recessions and, mon and observing the stock market and its effects on how the ec economy, changes in the economy affect different stocks. This is the experience you build up as a lifetime investor, which makes you, the longer you invest, the more you live through, the more you witness, because history repeats itself in the stock markets, the more powerful of an investor you become and the more accurate you can make of your forecasts.
Okay, let's move over to industry analysis. So now we're getting to the step two in the top-down approach. We're going to start looking at industry. So we want to understand the out. Each industry has its own particular outlook, its own particular risks, and we want to the insights we could develop will make a better idea of which industries we should be investing in. So we want to we want to understand the key issues of the industry and develop an industry outlook. So there are many different types of industries. And at particular points of history and time, different industries do better than other industries. So, for example, if you look at the cannabis industry uh, in North America um, and in Europe, that's starting to change as more countries are thinking about legalizing uh, marijuana. So these countries have uh, a particularly bright uh, industry future. So let's look at some key issues. So. If you're thinking about different industries, we want to analyze the industry in a way of, you know, what is the basic characteristics of this industry? What economic variables affect the operations, performance, what, you know, to help develop an outlook. So basically, you could think of an industry as the appliance industry, companies that make refrigerators, washing machines, uh, uh, stoves, ovens, microwaves, these type of things. If you have a growing population that is expanding, you're gonna, these people are going to need apartments and houses, and they're going to need their own appliances. So that would be one industry that would do well with an expanding demographic. And specifically demographic of people aged say, 22 to 30 who are typically looking to move out of their household and establish their own household. Okay, so how do we do this? Step one, we want to establish the competitive position of the industry in relationship to other industries. Um, so basically, we want to see, you know, how is this industry doing in relationship to other industries? So we're going to want to line them up in order of prosperity. Then we want to identify companies in the industry that hold a lot of promise. So you could look at, say, the software industry. There may only be five companies that look really good in the industry. And then a lot of mediocre companies. So we want to look for companies that have the best strategy, good market positions, good pricing ability, good size for economy of scale. So companies that could really make the most of a growing industry. So here's some questions that we would want to ask. So if we're looking at an industry and we don't know much about it, we want to know, okay, what is the fundamental nature of the industry? What do they do? How do they do it? Who do they sell to? And how, number two, how is the industry regulated? Is it regulated locally by um, local governments or is it um, regulated more on a federal level? How does labor play into the industry? How expensive is the labor? How many people do they need working there? This type of thing is how critical is labor? So if you look at um, the restaurant industry, labor is pretty critical to that. Okay. How important are technological developments? So if you look at you know, uh, device companies, phone companies, these are things where technology developments are very important. So you want to look at how well the company is, is positioned for developing these technological advancements. Which economic forces are especially important to the industry? So you want to see um, changing demographics, um, uh, inflation, uh, different aspects that we had talked about previously, money supply, how, how do these different forces affect this one industry? Uh, some of these forces may have no effect on the industry and some of them they may greatly affect the industry. So we want to really tie the industry to the different economic indicators we talked about earlier and see how do they relate to each other? Uh, and then also, what are the, finan the important financial and operating considerations for that industry? What is the really... Um, uh, points of interest really need to focus on. So if you're the banking industry, you're probably going to focus a lot on the changing aspects of interest rates. If you're a caterpillar and you're working in an industry that makes uh, industrial machinery, you want to look at how um, the change in the cost of metals may affect their financial uh, overall financials of the company considering that metals are the most the base biggest ingredient in making these vehicles okay so let's look at the industry growth cycle so companies have a natural growth cycle that's going to reflect 
the industry over time. So you, you have this initial development. So an industry that become, is developed, it's new, it's, uh, the risks are very high, you're not sure uh, what's going to happen. So let's just kind of say maybe we can go with the electric car vehicle. So a number not too long ago, there, there are almost no electric cars on the road. And this became a new um, initial development of the electric car as Tesla and other companies around the world started to make electric cars. And then we moved into this rapid expansion phase, which we're sort of still in now, where companies are all jumping on this electric vehicle, where new companies like Tesla, who are solely electric uh, vehicles, and then companies that are aligned with them, such as battery companies, um, such as uh, other suppliers to the industry. Uh, as this electric car industry starts to mature, meaning that the combustion engine vehicles decline and more and more car manufacturers, such as um, say Ford, GM, Toyota, Honda, they're all gearing up, uh, Volkswagen, they're all gearing up to make mostly electric vehicles. We're gonna hit that uh, mature growth which will still be growth of, the, of those electric vehicles and maybe 25 years from now we'll have this stability or decline in electric vehicles as a new possibly new engine new power source new tra mode of transportation is developed you can also think of it uh, also as a subset the what about the self-driving car the automatic car right now that's a very initial development and they're not selling many of these but all, all companies are working on cars that drive themselves this could be the next big thing after electric vehicles would be self-driving uh computer fully computerized cars that are being developed now which we might see a rapid expansion phase of this we'll definitely see that in your lifetime within your lifetime uh i predict this um you will no longer drive a car cars will drive themselves and even some countries our localities will make it illegal to even drive a car and the reason for that is cars that drive themselves are a lot safer once you take most acts of fact most accidents are caused by human error take human error out of the equation there'll be very few accidents so this overall would be a great boom to society um say a country like the united states you have usually fifty thousand people i believe die a year in car accidents that will be greatly reduced um, I would say to under 2,000 deaths a year from car accidents once uh, the fully automatic driving car is established. Okay, enough of that future talk. Let's come back to this slide, developing an industry outlook. So we're going to need sources of industry information. So there are industry service surveys. Brokerages usually provide some reports depending on how what the service level the brokerage is. There's articles in financial media. There are um, different financial websites and financial companies that will give you information about industries. Uh, now, to get access to expected industry responses to economic forecasts, that's going to be a little bit more tricky. So that's that's some uh, higher level research that you can easily do yourself uh, by just digging and um, doing the legwork, doing the research. You're like a, like a friend, like a financial detective trying to figure out, uh, are these products, the demand for these products increasing? Uh, what's the, what's the amount of spending in research development? How is it, uh, working out? So if you look at like the medical industry, the drug industry, there's a lot of research you can do on these different companies to see what products they have in the pipeline, the type of research they're doing, how likely is it for them to be approved? Uh, and that will give you what's the prospects, you know, of the growth for that company, the overall growth for the industry. So um, let's step down from the industry level and take a look at the firm level. So the fundamental analysis, we'll be looking at specific companies. So if you have growing markets like the cannabis market, the electric vehicle market, you might wanna say, which companies are the best positions uh, to take advantage of the, these growing opportunities in in these different fields you can also look at ai is a big field um, right now computer um, cloud computing is a big field and growing so the idea is we want to determine a stock's individual intrinsic value based on the individual stocks financial statements and we want to know 
we know everything we can know about their financial statements, their financial ratios, interpreting the numbers. So we want to take a deep dive into each individual company. So if an industry may consist of 10 companies, we want to take a deep dive into all 10 companies and try to put some sort of ranking together to figure out which companies are going to be the best investments to put our money into. So we know that the, the value of a company, the intrinsic value of a company has to be influenced by the performance of that company and the stock. So the stock is tied to the performance of the company. If the company is doing really well, the stock should do really well. So the company analysis, we want to look at, you know, a historical, um, we can only really look at historical data. We can't get future data. Uh, well, that's something we can estimate, maybe forecast, but looking at actual historical data will help give us an idea of the financial strength of the company in the past. And strong companies in the past tend to be strong companies in the future. So we want to get a better idea of the competitive position of the company. And we can look at the financial statements to get a better idea of their how their assets are growing, how they utilize their assets, um, how their sales are growing, the dynamics of their profit margins, the gross operational net, um, how liquid their asset mix is, their capital structure. So this is all time consuming and demanding work that many investors rely on other people to do this work for them and they read it in published um, stock reports or financial websites. Or you may find yourself working for a company that will hire you to do this analysis, to be a stock, an stock analyst. Very exciting job. So, but it, you need a certain level of experience and skill and it all starts with accounting and the basics of financial statements. So you don't have to be an accountant, but you do need to know how the basics of financial statements work with the most basic being the balance sheet. The balance sheet is just going to list some facts. What assets do the company own? Land, building, equipment, cash. What liabilities does the company have? Debts and bills. And what's the equity? So for most students, equity is the hardest part to understand. But basically, it's assets minus liabilities is your equity. So let's take it in a very small scale. You have a car that's worth $20,000. Now, you put $5,000 down on that car. So your equity is $5,000 and your liability is $15,000. Together, your equity and your liability is the total value of the car. It's the same thing for a business, but on a larger scale. Now, assets must equal liabilities plus owner's equity. So when you buy an asset, it's a combination of money that the shareholders have given the company and money that the company has borrowed. That is what makes up the capital used to buy assets. So a balance sheet, you want to look for a strong balance sheet. So here's an example of a balance sheet. Uh, you can look in the textbook for a clearer image of this. But basically, we start out with the most current assets, moving to longer term assets um, to give our total assets. Then we look at our current liabilities, our longer term liabilities, and our equity accounts to get our total uh, shareholders equity. And then we want to look at our total equity and liability together should match your total assets. So again, it's just really an inventory list of what do we own, what bills do we have to pay, and what equity or capital does the company have already employed. So a balance sheet is really just uh, one point in time looking at a snapshot of the company's most basic financial elements. So companies that have, um, I think a, str a strong balance sheet would be a company where the liabilities are under control, the liabilities are minimized, where their, their short-term and long-term liabilities are um, small. So the company is well-funded and the assets are mostly funded by equity, which makes their financial strength a lot stronger. Now, the income statement is sort of like if you ever worked a job, you get something called um, a paycheck or a pay stub. And the pay stub should list the money that you made, less any taxes and um, to get your net income at the bottom. So you have your gross income at the top and your net income at the bottom. The same thing for, it's similar for an income statement for a company. So it's a summary of the company's operating results. It could be for a month, it could be for um, 
a quarter or a year. And it's basically going to start out with revenues, which are what did they sell? Then you're going to subtract away from that the expenses, the costs of running the business, basically. And then you should come up with your profit or loss. So the income statement is going to show how successful the business has been over a particular period of time. So here's a basic income statement where and a lot of times when we look at these, we want to see the year over year change. And here we see revenues have increased. Cost of goods sold, of course, have increased along with revenues, but gross profits have increased. Um, we look at operating expenses have increased, but earnings before interest and tax that has gone down so that so we have this growth of sales and profits, but we have a faster growing amount of expenses that sucked away a lot of this increase. So this would be I would look at this as an analyst and say, why is your uh, selling and administration expenses going up so quickly? And they might say, well, we just hired 100 new people. So this would be an income statement where I would say a lot of that profit, you know, what's the plan for these people? How are they going to make more sales and more profit? If you hired a bunch of salespeople and next year you're going to double your sales, okay, I'm willing to concede a, a lower, uh, uh, um, a, um, a slower earnings per share growth this year because we're planning for a big next year. So it's all about how did they perform year over year and how is this setting up future performance. So income statement basically uh, is going to look at that. So you want to look at these income statement and the progression over time, how things are changing. And you can even make what's called a pro forma in income statement, which would be next year's guess of the income statement. So we also have a statement of cash flow. So a statement of cash flow looks at um, where the money's coming from. And we want to know a summary of how the money is coming into the company, how the money is going out of the company, and what the sources of that cash flow is. So investors like um, companies that have a good sources of cash flow and um, have positive cash flows, have enough money. Think of cash flow like oil that runs the engine of the business. We want to make sure we have enough of this oil and that it's running the business and generating um, opportunities for new investments in in, in growth in the, in, the in the company. So we want this, generally want to increase in cash. So if we look at a cash flow statement, we have a cash flow up from operations. So I think cash flow from operations is one of the most important, because this is showing that the, there's the business generating cash. If the business is generating cash, that's good. If the business is not generating cash for the company, that's a bad business. So number one, the, if we see that the cash for the business is increasing, that's a good thing. And here we see it decreasing. Uh, cash from investments. Investments typically are the company buying new buildings, buying new restaurants, buying new land. So the company's making investments in plant, property, and equipment to hopefully set themselves up to grow as a business. There are cases where company may receive, uh, may sell land or equipment or assets and have a positive cash flow, but mostly growing companies usually have a negative cash flow in the investment area. But that's okay because we want companies to invest and grow. Now, from financing, uh, it's okay if companies grow the cash flow from financing, but if they do too much of this, it makes the, ca the company risky because they're going to owe more money in interests. So at the bottom line, we want to, we of course want to know if there's a, if there's an increase or decrease of cash. And here we have an increase of cash, but the sources of the cash, where is it coming from? Is it coming from borrowing or is it coming from operations of the business? So this is things that analysts look at to determine is the company improving or not improving in its financials. And we're going to next move into this is going to be the end of part one. Part two will start with a with a ratio analysis, and this is a shortcut. Since many financial analysts aren't CPAs, aren't ex, you know highly experienced accountants, they need a shorthand for quickly interpreting the financial statements. And financial ratios are that quick shorthand to help help analysts better determine what's happening with the financial statements. So that will be in part two of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed part one, and I look forward to talking to you soon.